Sri Lanka's geostrategic location in the Indian Ocean has been known by seafarers dating back to 3rd century BC. Due to this reason, mariners from the east and the west in want of precious gems and spices sailed to this beautiful island nation, home to a multi-ethnic and multi-religious population living in peace and harmony. History states that national security of Sri Lanka was threatened due to invasions from South India since 230 BCE as much as 17 times forcing the rulers to shift their kingdoms from Anuradhapura to other cities. From the 16th century onwards, the national security of our country was jeopardized again when European powers kept the small island under their control, one after the other, for trade and security interest for nearly five centuries. Having gained independence from the British in 1948, sensing a potential danger to its national security, the first Prime Minister of Independent Ceylon entered into a defence pact with the British to protect it from aggression. The JVP insurrection of 1971 was an open revolt against the government and was the first internal threat to the national security after gaining independence and its resurgence in 1987, precipitated largely by the signing of the Industry Lanka Agreement, characterized by mass terror to overthrow the government, which was crushed in 1989. Defeating the LTTE and its terrorism, which had a motive to create an independent state of Tamil Elam, was the most significant challenge on national security in post-independence era. Assassinating two world leaders and inventing suicide bombers, it was branded as the most dangerous and deadly extremist in the world, having an allied land fighting force, a formidable naval force and a fledging air wing with near conventional capabilities. Natural disasters like 2004 tsunami had a devastating effect, challenging our preparedness and vulnerability for such eventualities and environment impacts aftermath had repercussions on the country's non-traditional facets of national security. The ISIS-inspired Easter Sunday attacks in 2019 were the deadliest violence Sri Lanka had witnessed since crushing the LTTE in 2009. Sri Lanka's first experience with jihadist mass violence was due to government's failure to appreciate and act on intelligence and thereby losing control over national security. The COVID-19 pandemic, neither traditional nor tangible, is one of the most recent challenges to health security, which brought about a paradigm shift to a new world order and dousing the fire of the new diamond averting the second largest oil spill in the world threaten our environmental security. Collapse or deterioration of national security eventually lead to a country losing its status as a nation state, realizing the need to incorporate the best minds and strategic thinkers to advise and assist the decision makers in handling emerging threats, a think tank exclusively dedicated 
for the national security was first mooted when the present president Gotabe Rajapaksha was the then secretary to the Ministry of Defense. A subsequent team of officials outlined the concept and drew the first blueprint of the institute which was sanctioned on 30th March 2016. With the first director general appointed on 1st August 2016, the institute initially functioned within the Ministry of Defense and shifted to the 8th floor of Suhurupaya building on 2nd January 2017. With an inspiring mission and a challenging mission, the institute functions under the stewardship of the president as the patron of an advisory council to a board of governors. With national security being given the first priority among the 10 key policies of the government, the institute strives to observe the changing dynamics of the concept of national security transcending through traditional to non-traditional threats by hosting a series of events. The inaugural International Conference Shangri-La Colloquium was organized in 2018 with experts around the globe addressing the security architecture of the region. Closed-door roundtable discussions such as threat lens and security salons are two events bringing together experts from the academic, diplomatic and security fields to discuss a particular threat to Sri Lanka's national security in addition to public lectures and roundtable discussions. With the appointment of new Director General, conferences and discussions in virtual space kicked off, bringing in a new dimension to the Institute through his visionary leadership. As another significant event, the Institute remembers to honor a fallen war hero once a year by conducting an annual memorial lecture. Contributions from renowned academia and quarterly news and events are compiled and serve as publications of the Institute. While the first ever defense policy of Sri Lanka was compiled by the Institute with military experts. We are also privileged to have experts on security and defense with eminent analysts and practitioners from the region and beyond as a resource pool to better formulate the contribution we envisage towards devising policy and strategies. Our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant and to face the challenges of change. Now I request Admiral Professor Jayanath Kolumbage, Director General, Institute of National Security Studies, to officially welcome the gathering. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for Institute of National Security to have all of you with us this afternoon. And I would like to welcome the Honorable Minister, our own Admiral Veerasekar, and also General Kamal Gunaratna, who is the Secretary of Defense, and our patron, and also Admiral Gunasekar, who incidentally was my first commander of the Navy when I joined the Navy in 1978, and other retired admirals, Admiral Sandagiri is here, and the orator of this evening, Admiral Samara Singha, and of course our Navy commander, Admiral Ulugetanna, and also Madam Monica Fernando and the two sons. The daughter is not here. I think she is in Mozambique, uh, somewhere in Africa. But I am sure in her heart she is with us too. And also other colleagues, senior officers, ladies and gentlemen. I mentioned to you a reason as to why Admiral Clancy Fernando was killed. Of course, uh, our Samanti Veera Singh, who is additional secretary, who is in charge of uh, the Institute of National Security. And I gave you an answer, he was different. So let me ponder upon briefly as to why I came to that conclusion. I remember 
in 1991, when Admiral Clancy Fernando became the commander of the Sri Lanka Navy, the things were not very good in the country, and things were not getting better. And I was a very junior officer at that time, but then I had the great privilege of, you know, being with him on some occasion, and I remember. One thing he said in 1991, he said, "This way, we will never ever win this war." He said, "Unless we think differently, unless we do things differently, we are going to battle for few more decades." Ladies and gentlemen, in 1991, Admiral Clancy Fernando thought differently. And I was a very young, aspiring officer. I just completed my landing craft assignment, and he said one day, "Can we load a main battle tank into a landing craft? Take the landing craft near the coast and shoot at the LTTE." We tried that. We tried that. Unfortunately, no offense to anyone, because the whole country we were like this. My take is until 2006, we did not embrace the change that Admiral Clancy Fernando thought about in 1991. To highlight the main focus of today's event, please draw your attention to the screen for a short video clip of the life and times of Admiral Clancy Fernando, VSV, NDC, PSC of Sri Lanka Navy. Born in 1938, Admiral Clancy Fernando was an outstanding product of Prince of Wales College, Morocco. He joined the Navy as an officer cadet in Royal Sino Navy in December 1957. After his initial training, lasting for a few months, he proceeded for further training to the prestigious Britannia Royal Naval College, Dartmouth. And was commissioned as acting sub-lieutenant on 1st September 1960. Admiral Fernando gradually rose in ranks and held many prestigious appointments, such as the commanding officer of SNMS Samudra Devi, which was the flagship at that time, and commandant Naval and Maritime Academy, the premier officer training institute of Sri Lanka Navy. In addition to being appointed to command. The western and the eastern areas, respectively. During his exemplary service record, he has successfully completed a number of training courses abroad. He is an alumnus of Defence Services and Staff College in India and National Defence College at New Delhi, India, where future policy makers are equipped on structured exposure to diverse issues related to national security. He was in good stead when his career took its decisive turn. He was made acting commander of the navy on 1st August 1991, and subsequently promoted to the rank of vice admiral, and was made the 11th commander of the navy on 1st November 1991. On assuming command, he made several courtesy calls to dignitaries. And maintain cordial relationships with great sense of diplomacy. His alma mater felicitated this distinguished old boy proudly, as he was the first ever military commander to be produced. Being a communication specialized officer from INS Bhimruti in India, he contributed greatly towards efficient and secure communication. By devising the first ever cryptographic system, Singhali, for the Sri Lanka Navy, which is still in use today, replacing the system that was being followed by Royal Navy. Just four days after he assumed duties as the acting commander of the Navy on 4th August 1991, the victorious troops of Operation Balavigya ended the LTTE siege. At Elephant Pass, after 22 days of fierce fighting, after establishing a beachhead at Bethlehem, 
representing the Navy's excellent ambiguous contribution given for this unprecedented operation in the military history of Sri Lanka. Riyad Bill Fernando was in the forefront with Army Commander Lieutenant General Hamilton Manasimu, Northern Commander Major General Densil Kobakadwa and Task Force Commander Brigadier Vijay Vimala Ratna marching victoriously towards the Elephant Pass camp. Another joint military operation conducted during his tenure as Acting Commander of the Navy was Operation Walampuri launched on 18th October 1991 to liberate the islands of Jaffna Peninsula and Walampuri too which secured a beach at Punavin and a naval base with a radar station at Nagativanturi in the Jaffna Lagoon where many battles were fought amidst contact mines to prevent LTT movements to and from the peninsula. On 28th May 1992, Operation Sea Lion was launched under Vice Admiral Fernando's direction, backed by Army and Air Force, and assault was led to Velvetitore, birthplace of Rebel Supreme Velpilli Prabhakaran, and destroyed LTT's Maritime Communication Center and its Sea Tiger headquarters. Another important tri service operation conducted during his tenure was Operation Balavegia 2. On 28 June 1992, in the objective of physically linking the Elephant Pass camp with Wetfile Kani, where many amphibious operations were conducted. During all these operations, he played an active role and was a familiar sight on the front lines in Wetfile Kani, Punari, Nagativanturi, and Elephant Pass, and even to great risk to boost the morale of the men and export them. Apart from his battle hardiness, Admiral Fernando was a very social officer who loved singing and dancing and participated in many social events, both within and outside the Navy throughout his career. A ship is said to be commissioned when she is built, reconditioned or overhauled for operational duty. This is the commissioning ceremony of SMNS Ranagaja on 9th March 1992. A ship built indigenously for the Navy by Columbo Dockyard Limited. The ship was commissioned by that time Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, late Mr. D.B. Vijayatunga. SLNS Ranagaja was deployed in many amphibious operations and faced many battles successfully and proudly serves the Sri Lanka Navy to date. Late Admiral Fernando had the opportunity of being the chief guest for the commissioning parade of 7th Inter KDA and 19th Inter Cadet officers held on 15 September 1991 at the main parade ground of the Naval and Maritime Academy in Trinko. Calling on foreign dignitaries and maintaining cordial relationships boosted over naval relations and resulted in creating a better image of our country through such diplomacy exercised by the leadership. Fernando was an excellent shooter and a lover of tennis and squash. He rendered human service to uplift sports activities in the Navy. Many talented sportsmen and women were recognized by late Admiral Fernando during his short tenure as the commander of the Navy. He took a lively interest in the affairs of the retired naval personnel as well. One significant event he personally organized with great pride was the sea burial of ashes of the 4th Commander of the Navy, Rear Admiral Royce Dimel.
It is said that one of his saddest moments as the commander of the Navy was to hear the demise of three military commanders whom he has offered much General Densil Kobak Adwan, Major General Vijay Vimalanathan and his Northern Naval Commander Rear Admiral Mohan Jayamahan who were killed with other military officers on 8th August 1992 during a planning mission for the next offensive to retake the LTT stronghold of Javna City. Targeted by LTTE for intensifying war in the Javna Lagoon, forgotten their main supply route. He was assassinated in Colombo by a suicide motorcyclist on 16th November 1992 while travelling to naval headquarters in his official car from his official residence at London Place. And the nation bade farewell to him with full naval honours and with heavy hearts. He was posthumously promoted to the rank of Admiral. His name is etched in history as the highest ranking military officer to make the supreme sacrifice in Sri Lanka during the three decade war and probably the first serving naval commander to be assassinated in the world by a terrorist organization. Admiral Clancy Fernando will go down in the annals of naval history as a brave leader and a master mariner who gave his commitment and life in defending the national cause of peace, unity, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. As the chairman of the Institute of National Security Studies, I consider this as a great pride and a privilege to address this gathering of the annual memorial lecture conducted by the INSS with the dual aims of commemorating the war heroes of Sri Lanka while providing the opportunity for the future generations to learn and study about the great military strategists and war heroes, those who have ever existed in this country. This endeavor initiated by the INSS is intended to share the knowledge required to instill strategic thinking and to build professionalism among the future military leaders of Sri Lanka. I still remember the day he was killed in action. I was a young major serving in army headquarters and I was given with a Suzuki Maruti Jeep, Gypsy. So I was in my Jeep with the uh, Slave Island Railway Gate and uh, train was passing and I saw a naval motorcade and I realized that it was the then Navy commander. So they were in a hurry to move and the moment the gate was open, it rushed. And I also started my journey slowly and within two minutes I heard the explosion and I also rushed to the location and it was a very sad and pathetic scene and I saw Madame Fernando also rushing into the place and uh, it was one of the saddest occasion during my whole military career to see a service commander just killed in action by a brutal terrorist organization. His commitment during Operation Balavega alongside General Densil Kobmegadua to land troops at Vettilai Kearney, which was the single largest operation ever undertaken by the Sri Lanka Navy, in that magnitude is highly commendable. Further, the progression he has pioneered in the Sri Lanka Navy within his whole service to the nation and especially during his tenure as the commander of the Navy to ensure the sovereignty of our beloved motherland thus stand praiseworthy. However, 
the country had to bear the sad demise of Admiral Clancy Fernando in the year 1992 as he was assassinated by the brutal terrorist organization LTTE and he is known to be the most senior officer in the Sri Lankan military to be killed in action in the line of duty towards the motherland. I firmly believe that this session would allow us the prospect of deeply understanding his character while offering the opportunity for our younger generations to expose themselves to his achievements and the absolute bravery displayed by him which is a perfect blend of tenacity and perseverance that would assist our new generations to mold their careers towards a clear, professionally vibrant future. Furthermore, this opportunity will also allow his beloved wife and the family members of late Admiral Clancy Fernando to call back their past memories and to feel proud of him as a war hero who has extended a highly commendable, trustworthy service to the nation, to the motherland and to its people. Moving on to the next item in the agenda, I am honoured to invite Mrs. Monica Fernando, wife of late Admiral Clancy Fernando, to garland the portrait of the late Admiral. And I cordially invite Mr. Nishan Fernando and Mr. Dinuk Fernando to accompany her. I respectfully invite Admiral Tisara Samarasinghe to commence the oration. Over to you, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mrs. Monica Fernando, two sons, grandchildren, their dear relatives, Honorable Sarat Virasekar, the Minister of National Security, Secretary of Defense, General Kamal Gunratna, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Admiral Jayanath Kolambage, the Admiral who selected me to the Navy in 74, Admiral D.B. Gunasekar. So I'm honored to see you here. Admiral Sandagiri, our own Navy Commander Nishant Ulagatanda, other senior officers of the Tri Forces, other senior officials of the Institute of National uh, Security Studies, other invitees. It is my high privilege and profound honor to be invited in the to address you all in the most one of the most important events of our country respecting a true war hero it was moving madam to see you walk up to Garland, the Admiral's photograph. It said a lot of things in this moment to us. Before I get into my speech or the oration, with your permission, let me share how close I was to Admiral Clancy Fernando and his family. I joined the Navy in 74, started the cadet training with 12 of 
11 other batchmates. But we had a dream being said to us. Pardon me for mentioning this, this is a fact. Dartmouth. I have seen Dartmouth in the We Join the Navy film because I was shown that before I joined the Navy by one of my friends. So we joined the Navy, it was a dream because we heard some set of officers 17 years before had the opportunity of going as a batch. So once again, thank you for selecting me to go. And they, they gave us one single birth to Dartmouth. And I had the privilege to be selected. So there was no officer who had been to Dartmouth 17 years ago and the senior most. Few officers were, one was Admiral Clancy Fernand. He called me. I vividly remember him calling me to, at that time at Rangala, uh, Captain Lekam Basam, Lekam Basam was there, Admiral Jayasuriya was there, all three very seniors telling me how I should perform, how I should behave. And he gave, said, one thing he told me, you are going on your own, you will have no Sri Lankans around you, what, like what I had. Keep your head above your shoulder. Don't lose your head. Get the maximum out of it. And see that you lead the pathway for others to follow. Jayanath is a beneficiary of that. And he insisted that nothing less than topping the batch. And he mentioned there was appointment which they could not achieve. And he inspired me. So I have done justice to that selection, sir. And the other thing was when I was the cadet training officer under his tutelage as the commandant of the Naval Maritime Academy. Batch number 11 was entrusted to my authority to train them. I'm privileged that that batch has produced two commanders, Admiral Rana Singh and Admiral Sinaya. We were midshipmen. The commandant said, Samara Singh, let's get you a team will go for outing and we went to the other some of the military officers will know we have a water reservoir few kilometers away from Trincomalee called Headworks our agricultural project but a massive tank and we went with the cadets team for a camping 11 cadets myself and my batchmate was the security officer Provost Marshal Admiral Samaratunga and including Admiral, we all camped on the tank bank in tents. Of course, we had the night campfire. So we got up in the morning. Two fishing boats were lying on the banks with a orua, the boats with a balancing collaver, you call it. He said, let's take a ride. And I got into it with my two batchmates and their wives, one uh, the OIC of that place. He took one boat road with that uh, one of the OIC's pregnant wife and himself and the officer. Midway in the tank, it's a 60 feet deep tank with infested with crocodiles. The balance part of the boat gave away and we were six of us in that boat and Admiral Clancy Fernando was rowing with a few uh, meters away or maybe 50 meters away. 
the boat collapsed. Tropel. Myself, my wife, the other couple, we were all in the water, we were struggling. He could not come to our help. There was a pregnant lady in the boat. He rowed fast to the shores for them to come. Then the fishermen saw then these two, I don't know which one jumped to the water. These two young boys, the Tomian swimmers, Nishant or Dinuk, I don't know which one. They removed the shirt, they tried, jumped. But rescue mission was done. I was, rescu uh, of course, we managed ourselves, a fishing boat came. I'm just trying to tell you his leadership and his value for team building was enormous. That is where I, where I got closest to him. And after that, he managed to take us to safety and played a tremendous role in training these two officers. Then he appointed me as the training commander of the same academy. But unfortunately, I was in command of, I just come command of a gunboat during the Balawege. I met him in the operation, the, what, all pictures that you saw. The, my oration today is based on general concept of co-sea power and it is my own judgment and experience that I am trying to share with you and I'm, I request you to be patient with my oration. Sea power of our island nation. Security, prosperity and vital interest. Countries are increasingly coupled off to those of other nations. Our nation interests are best served by fostering peaceful global system comprised of interdependent networks of trade, finance, information, law, people and governance. In addition, elements determining a nation's resilience and power include geography, population, natural resources, economic capacity, military strength, political stability, and information. Realistically, military power and its projection that are major determinant of national power, allowing the other elements to play their respective roles in a protected and secure environment. Traditionally, island states use maritime strategy to achieve political objectives, goals with sea power acting as the main element of national power. States that do not employ their maritime strategy or mismanage it usually face consequences. The ocean connects the nations of the world, even those countries that are landlocked. Because the maritime domain, the world oceans, sea beds, estuaries, islands, coastal areas, littorals, and the airspace about them support 90% of the world trade, which carries the life blood of a global system that links every country on earth. Covering three quarters of the planet, the oceans make neighbors of people around the world. They enable nations to help friends in need and to confront and defeat aggression far from their own shores. Our challenge is to apply sea power in a manner that protects Sri Lanka's vital interests, even as it promotes greater collective security, stability, and trust that we all pursue. Defending our own homeland and defeating adversaries in war remain the indisputable ends of sea power. Hence, it must be applied more broadly 
if it is to continue to serve our natural national interests to the future. Strategic and effective use of improvised sea power of Sri Lanka by the Sri Lanka Navy with air and land support in successfully countering international logistics support and supply chain of the adversary, venturing bravely and courageously to high seas of international waters in 2007 and 2008 played the pivotal and critical role in securing our national sovereignty and national security to achieve the honorable peace that we enjoy today. The historical perspective in sea power. Navies are linked with constituents of sea power which are interlinked to each other. These constituents have been used in early Sri Lankan maritime domain, some of which you saw. Sri Lanka had a great history as a maritime nation with archaeological proof of voyages of King Parakram Babu I in the kingdom of Polo Naru. In a maritime nation, people, society, governments are contributing to maritime domain development. Sri Lanka is a small state which has great opportunity to contribute to maritime related activities. It is the responsibility of the respective government of Sri Lanka to admire this and strengthen civil and military maritime capabilities. It can be established that this region's strategic importance in terms of commerce and trade too was noted and such Chinese Admiral Seng has been purported to have visited the region and Sri Lanka in particularly in 1405. These historical examples prove the gamut of nature of a concept called sea power. And Sri Lanka being an island nation, these strategies must incorporate with national security policies of the country. Sea power, components of national power of any nation will be identified as diplomacy, military, economy, and information. However, it is agreed that elements which determine the nation's resilience and power include geography, population, system of education, natural resources, economic capacity, military strength, political stability, and information. In this connection, military power and its projection will be the key factor of showcasing a national power while other elements play their respective roles to ensure a nation's aspirations in a well-secured, protected environment. It is a common phenomenon to use military strategy to achieve a well-secured nation with the aim of protecting and achieving national objectives. We have done that. Traditionally, island nations use maritime strategy to achieve national objectives and goals with sea power as they as the key determinant of their national strategy. In here, it is pertinent to mention that maritime strategy is the plan with, by which a maritime power of a nation is, a, is developed and used for attaining national objectives with the sphere of national strategy. Along with this definition, sea power or maritime power is identified as the na nation's ability to use seas to safeguard and progress its national interest. Hence, it is pillar of a national security policy is a key enabler in a formal formulation and implementation of viable national military strategy, especially in island nations like us. In addition, maritime power which facilitates and enables use of seas by all stakeholders to meet national objectives. Establishing sea power in a country is directly helped to strengthen national policies. Naval operations and civil maritime capabilities can be achieved via commercial operations. Military maritime capabilities are basically naval ships, craft, naval surveillance systems, intelligence, and coastal protection units. Under civil maritime capability, merchant shipping, merchant marine, 
fishing, marine insurance, shipbuilding, and repair can be taken to consideration to establish sea power. The combination between these two elements are essential. In this perspective, Navy is the main instrument and manifestation of the mar maritime power of a nation state. The reason the Navy exists is to safeguard the nation's use of seas for its legitimate sovereign purposes, rights, whilst concurrently guarding against unfriendly use of sea by others in peaceful and legitimate means. According to Admiral Mann, U.S. Navy, nations with most powerful navy would control the world. Further, he highlighted six principles underpinning the development of a sea power of a nation, namely geographical position, physical conformation, extent of territory, population size, national character, and character of the of governance. Geographical, geopolitical, and geostrategic perspective of the region were important. Indian Ocean has been an important location in the strategic calculations of the great powers of the world, primarily due to the economic impact of the Indian Ocean in the East-West maritime trade. Over the past decade, South Asia and its Indian Ocean region have emerged as a focus of tremendous international concern at the turn of the new millennium. It would be noted that the region is historically well known for its great strategic salience and enormous market potential. It is established that this region has always played a significant role in the economics and politics of international relations. Sri Lanka, unlike the other South Asian nations, is located in the center of the Indian Ocean at a strategic position. As we all know, Sri Lanka's strategic location in the center of the Indian Ocean and its position as an emerging maritime hub have had a considerable impact on regional political, economic, and leadership landscape. The country's geographical position of the vital interest as a dominates the sea lines of communication and influences the world trade flying from east to west and west to east in the Indian Ocean. Hence, three lines of communication are strategic areas critical to our nation's lifeline. In addition, the geostrategic rivalry between the US, India, and China, the increasing interest of Japan, Australia, and United Kingdom, and European countries in the Indian Ocean are of much concern to Sri Lanka as she seeks to avoid disruptions in the sea lanes of communication in a maritime domain that are also used for international navigation. Therefore, we need to enhance our sea power in all aspects, including surveillance, intelligence, deterrence, and defense capability to meet the unforcing traditional and non-traditional maritime challenges like we faced. Furthermore, due to the strategic relevance of both China and India, have shown an increasing interest towards the Indian Ocean and, and towards this end, engineered several key strategies uh, and initiatives, like example, Maritime Silk Route Initiative by the former and the Indian Ocean Strategy by the latter. They have also identified Sri Lanka as a strategic location in the Indian Ocean as an ideal focal point to implement policies and objectives. This illustrates the importance of Indian Ocean plays in terms of global politics and can be further understood by Admiral Alfred Mahan's statement, whoever controls the Indian Ocean dominates Asia. It is for these reasons, example, surge in trade routes and center role in place in the global politics that the Indian Ocean will be, region will be the focal point of global interactions increasing Sino-Indian interest. Sea lanes in the Indian Ocean are considered amongst the most strategically important to the world as well as in Sri Lankan economy. According to the Journal of the Indian Ocean Region, more than 80% of the sea, world's seaborne trade 
in oil transits through the Indian Ocean choke points with 40% passing through the Strait of Hormuz, 35% through the Strait of Malacca, and 8% through the Beb El Madab Strait. In addition to being strategically located and being the main route for sea trade, Indian Ocean region is also crucial for energy security, resource that abandoned in the region. Therefore, all developing societies need access the new material produced around the Indian Ocean littorals. According to Kim Basley, Australia's ambassador to the United States, I quote, in the long term, the Indian Ocean is going to be massively more significant in global politics than it has ever been before, unquote. India's unique geographic location formed the cornerstone of India's aspirations to dominate the Indian Ocean or even to transform the Indian Ocean into India's ocean. Many Indian strategists view the Indian Ocean as India's rightful domain and contend that India will have to play a very large role in the region if the prospects of the peace and cooperation is to grow. In addition, remaining of renaming of Asia-Pacific plus South Asia and the Indian Ocean region as the Indo-Pacific are examples that have emerged as new geopolitical and geostrategic areas where diverse and divergent interests have been set out by different nations. This illustrates the role of the Indian Ocean currently plays and it's set to play in global politics. However, the geostrategic conditions in the Indian Ocean region are still developing. The current trends being seen indicating that the three main powers involved, India, China and US have their own priorities with potential for clash, may not be conducive to the establishment of regional peace and prosperity, a dream of all concerned nations what we pursue. Relationship between sea power and Navy. Use of sea power to influence actions and activities at sea and ashore and the expeditionary character of versatility and maritime forces provide a nation the asymmetric advantage of enlarging or contracting its military footprint areas where access is denied or limited. The reach that sea power could extend effective influence in achieving national objectives was displayed by United Kingdom in 1982 when Naval Task Force exclusively with Merchant Marine ventured 8,000 nautical miles, 1,300 kilometers away from United Kingdom to Falkland Islands in South Atlantic Ocean. Air, sea, land and Underwater battles under single naval command were fought by naval task force using career-borne aircraft, submarines, surface platforms, fleet auxiliaries, and Royal Marines on land. The speed, flexibility, agility, and scalability of marine forces provide joint or combined force commanders a range of options for responding any crisis. Additionally, integrated maritime operation either within formal alliance structures such as North Atlantic Treaty Organization or more informal arrangements such as Global Maritime Partnership Initiative send powerful messages to aggressors that the nations will act with others to ensure collective security and prosperity. Hence, Sri Lanka's maritime responsibilities are extensive and our security interests are diverse. We are accountable for the management, conservation and protection of the vast exclusive economic zone in the region, an area far greater than our land mass. In support of Sri Lanka, in support of the Sri Lankan government, the Navy has to closely monitor the evolving maritime security situation, emerging challenges and importantly, the tactics required to counter them in an effective way. With the possible future expansion of the outer continental margin, 
the task of the Sri Lanka Navy will be broadened. With these responsibilities, it is suggested that the Navy has to expand in size, resources, and platforms. The professionalism and the ability of our naval forces enable us to provide safety security against full spectrum of maritime security activities with confidence, very important, which is ranging from combat operations and contribution for humanitarian assistance missions. Our maritime forces are flexible, adaptable, and capable of responding quickly, decisively to range of situation like we did recently with the tanker. Now the Navy extend the Sri Lanka's reach and influence and have the poise, persistence to operate independently wherever they are needed to be. Sri Lanka Navy by virtue of its operation has a very proud and a strong history of working closely with our neighbors as well as global friends and allies. This relationship and tradition will become increasingly important that we head into an uncertain security future where the only thing that we know to expect is the unexpected. I am concerned that the amazing, amazing, interesting and admirable work of our maritime sector the silently on a daily basis is not properly understood by our stakeholders. Like most navies, we suffer from the understandable but unfortunate lack of awareness by the general public. Perhaps it is understandable in part because our citizens now mainly concentrate only on the fishery resources and have almost no exposure to ships or to the other marine and maritime industry. They have become unfamiliar with the vital role that the ocean plays in a global trade, commerce and security. However, the role that the Sri Lanka Navy has to play today to secure the coast and the vast area of seas around make them, the, make them to plan how best it can use its manpower, resources, infrastructure, platforms to meet current and future challenging requirements. The blue economy, the blue planet Earth is dominated by maritime domain with over 70% of the surface is covered by water. Nearly 80% of, of the world population lives within 200 nautical miles of the coast and about 90% of the world trade transit by sea. Oceans are central to life on Earth. The world economy is tightly interconnected. Over the past four decades, total seaborne trade has, then, has more than quadrupled. Ninety percent of the world trade, two-thirds of the petroleum are transported by sea. Sea lanes and supporting shore infrastructure are the lifeline of the modern global economy. Mega ports. Visible and vulnerable symbols of the modern distribution system that relies on free transit through increasingly urbanized littoral regions is what needed. The concept of blue economy has opened new horizons for economic development of the coastal countries through utilizing sea and marine resources at national and international level. The concept has become a buzzword for sustainable development particularly in drafting the post-2015 development goals. It is argued that island nations like us depend on economic, oceanic economic ac activities like fisheries and commercial transportation. Coastal and island developing countries have remained at the forefront of the blue economy advocacy, recognizing that oceans have a major role to play in humanity's future. Therefore, it is necessary to consider the blue economy in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication as one of the important tools available for achieving sustainable development as it contributes to the eradicating poverty as well as sustained economic growth, enhancing social inclusion, 
improving human welfare, creating opportunities for employment, and decent work for all while maintaining healthy functioning of the Earth's ecosystem. We must never forget that. Blue economy conceptualizes ocean as development space, where spatial planning integrates conversation, sustainable use, oil and mineral wealth extraction, bioprospecting, sustainable energy production, and marine transport. Following areas could be identified as the fundamental principles in the economy to support ocean industry, ocean commerce, ocean science, and maritime operations. Optimizing the benefit received from the development of their marine environment, such as fishery agreements, bioprospecting, oil and mineral extraction. Promoting national equity, including gender equity, and the, in particular, the generation of inclusive growth of decent job for all. Properly reflecting in the development of seas beyond national jurisdiction, including the refinement of international governance mechanisms and their concerns as states proximate to seabed development. The role of marine resources in poverty elevation acquiring in food productions, protecting environmental balance, facing adverse impact of climate change, and other economic possibilities are unlimited. But with the potentialities and possibilities, the challenges are also a company to this. Ensuring these are the challenges I listed, ensuring sovereignty over the total coastal area is a task maintaining security of the economic area, establishing marine-friendly infrastructure for maritime and marine tourists, protecting the area from international smugglers' threats, maintaining investment-friendly environment in the awarded areas, sustainable use of biodiversity, maintaining marine and coastal ecosystems, preserving mangrove and seagrass, addressing climate change and managing carbon emission, maintaining sea level rise and change in ecosystems, temperatures from coral bleaching, addressing the ocean acidification and blue carbon, keeping the sea area free from pollution and marine debris, governing human population and intensification of agriculture, technical challenges in exploration, extraction, mineral carbon and oil resources from the seabed, 50, 60 years down the line, we will have the privilege of doing that. Of course, they involve high cost in all this. Future sea power. Expansion of the global system has increased the prosperity of many nations. Yet their continued growth may create increasing competition for resources and capital with other economic powers. Competition. The heightened popular expectation an increased competition for resources coupled with scarcity. Many encourage nations to exert wider claims of sovereignty over greater expand, expanses of the ocean, waterways, islands, natural resources, which, are result, which will result in conflict amongst nations. We see it in the world today. Similarly, technology is rapidly expanding. Marine activities such as energy development, resource extraction, and other commercial activity in under the ocean. Hence, climate change is inevitable, while these developments offer opportunities for growth. They are potential source of competition and conflict for access and natural resources. Globalization, multiculturalism will also be shaping human migration patterns, health, education, culture, and the conduct of conflict. Those conflicts may increase and are characterized by hybrid blend of traditional and irregular tactics, decentralized planning and execution, and non-state actors using both simple and also sophisticated technologies in innovative ways we are experiencing. Weak or corrupt governments 
growing dissatisfaction among the disfranchised, religious extremism, ethnic nationalism, and changing demographics often spurred on by the uneven and sometimes unwelcome advances of globalization which exacerbate tensions and are contributors to conflict. Concurrently, a rising number of transnational actors and rogue states encourage and enable with unprecedented access to global stage could cause widespread disruptions in an effort to increase their power and influence. Their actions often designed to purposely incite conflict between other parties will complicate attempts to diffuse and ally regional conflicts. Proliferation of weapons technology and information has increased capacity of nation states and transnational actors to ch challenge maritime access, evade accountability for attacks and manipulate public perception. That has been done, manipulating public perception. Asymmetric use of technology will pose a range of threats to the United States and its partners. Even more worrisome the appetite for nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction is growing among nations and non-state antagonists. At the same time, attacks on legal, financial, and cyber systems can be equally, if not more, disruptive than kinetic weapons. Nuclear disarmament, national, dis nuclear disarmament and national policies of non-aggression being incorporated to strategic engagement by relevant sea powers will pave the way for a hopeful future with no destructive confrontations but a collaborative approach for a viable solution for peace and economic development. This is what I propose. Conclusion. Sri Lanka's maritime geography has had a strong influence on our history and our view of the world. As an island nation, Sri Lanka is particularly dependent on maritime trade, safety, security, and freedom of movement at sea are critical to our economic prosperity and security. So we must work with other nations to keep global trade moving and to promote good order at sea with all legitimate seafarers, not just for region, but the entire global community. The silent but significant and positive contributory impact that our seafarers and merchant marine make to our national economy being employed at sea and in port operations around the world require further recognition, support and development as a matter of absolute urgency. By securing our maritime environment, we protect Sri Lanka's national interest while contributing to regional security and stability and harmony. Sri Lanka's maritime interests in the region are growing, particularly as we work together with regional nations to promote security and prosperity. Sea power and the way the navies operate in the 21st century must also adapt to this evolving environment. The judicious and measured use of sea power will require much greater levels of global cooperation, increased interoperability, and a better shared understanding of the nature of the threats we are going to face together. The bottom line is that we face an increasingly uncertain future with a mix of traditional and non-traditional threats to our security. This requires us to be prepared with range of responses up to and including lethal force. On the international stage, Sri Lanka strongly emphasizes the cooperation as the basis for stability, especially the relationship with regional powers. We are practicing a diversified approach to the management and prioritization of its vast maritime area. Hence, we need more broad cooperation and a pragmatic policy based on mutual respect for the parties concerned. Equal 
ground plane. Sri Lanka is in a fortunate position of being on a very good terms with our near neighbors as well as other nations. We aim to be open, transparent in our dealings with other nations and I am proud to note that the Sri Lanka Navy has always played a significant role in building confidence, capacity, engagement with understanding and rapport between nations. The unprecedented success of the 2010 Sri Lanka Navy 60th anniversary celebration with all leading sea powers of the world and the region physically presenting themselves in Colombo in their strength and the 10-year internationally acclaimed progress of the Gold Dialogue International Maritime Conference inaugurated in 2010 are clear evidence of the Sri Lanka initiatives for collaborative policy for strategic vision and engagement. In spite of having a relatively small population, Sri Lanka continues to attract regional and global powers in various pretexts to achieve their national interest of global reach and naval and maritime domination in the Indian Ocean. We see that. Sri Lanka being a country that has honorably practiced neutrality and non-alignment within a democratic frame of framework in their long history is now faced with influential friends who are economically and military powerful willing to engage in various modes of investment. Sri Lanka's clean record of neutrality, non-alignment, non-involvement and tried and tested democratic practices will give a clear and a strong message to interested parties ready to engage Sri Lanka. Every such investment will carry the obvious element of self-interest that Sri Lanka as a smart nation should be capable of rationalizing and visualizing the strategically to understand accurately their intention and our best options. Anticipating and using the regional and the global picture, geostrategic position and the requirements with an open mind is considered the prudent approach advantageous to our own benefit and interest. Open mind. Accordingly, suitable engagement in education, national defense, economic stability, connectivity, and internal national mechanisms to protect and sustain the population stand out as top priorities in this endeavor. It is well understood that self-interest is the motivator of economic investment. And the competition is the economic regulator. Together, these two elements of self-interest and competition guide resources to the most needed and valued position that would yield desired positive results. Well, the late Admiral Clancy Fernando has tried to shape the thinking of sea power of island state in 80s. We saw that. In 1985 and 1987, he, was, he has authored several articles that have chapters discussing these elements that are very prominent today. Just as he analyzed the necessity of Kilali Lagoon operations in 1991, Admiral is there, Operation 91 after the Elephant Pass siege, I am of the opinion that he could have used his weight to focus on matters related to sea power in today's geostrategic context had we continued to cherish his leadership. Unfortunately, he left us. In an era of the end of the Cold War in Indian Ocean, late Admiral foresaw the necessities of securing national interest on the oceans, taking example of the past history, which was his forte. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to leave you with the thought of the term smart power, which in my opinion determines success of any nation. This is the use of right balance of countries' hard power, 
of military and economic means as an approach to international political relation that is combined and merged with the soft power. The attraction and persuasion through business, educational, cultural, societal, technological and digital strength for exerting and influencing foreign policy and political will and values. Sea power of an, an island nation must therefore sensibly and judiciously, judiciously maneuver between hard and soft power to be a smart sea power. Thank you very much and I, it's considered a great privilege that I could do this oration and I thank once again for the honor of being invited, uh, Jayanath and uh, dear Secretary of Defense, Kamal and Madam for accepting for me to talk of Admiral. The three things I saw in him is skill, knowledge and leadership. Thank you very much. Rebel Sarat Vila Sekara, Minister of Public Security. General Kamal Gunratna, Secretary of Defense. Admiral Professor Jayanath Kolamage, Foreign Secretary and Director General of the Institute of National Security Studies, Sri Lanka. Vice Admiral Nishanta Ulugetanna, Commander of the Navy. Admiral Tisra Samana Singha, Dorata. Admiral Basil Gunasekara and the other past commanders present here this evening. Senior officials of the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of uh, State Ministry of National Security. Members of the Diplomatic Corps. Rear Admiral Dimutu Gunawandana and the staff of the Institute of National Security Studies, Sri Lanka. All serving military personnel and retired military personnel present today, ladies and gentlemen. I stand here before you, especially on behalf of my dear mother and the other members of the family of late Admiral Clancy Fernando. This includes myself, my brother, my sister who is not here today, our respective spouses, and six grandchildren. They will take forward my father's legacy and his love for Sri Lanka. We appreciate the presence of Honorable Sarat Veerasekara along with our family. He came as one of our guests. Thank you for being here. He has served with my father and I'm happy to say he was one officer who was trusted by my father professionally as well as in a personal capacity. Thank you for that and for being with us even after my father's demise. We also wish to thank General Kamal Gundatna, Secretary of Defense, for authorizing this event and for taking time out from your obviously busy schedule to be with us during this entire proceedings. Thank you very much. It has been 28 long years since my father's assassination. It has not been easy. But we remain a proud family. We are deeply moved by the many who served under him and appreciate his contribution, not only to the Sri Lanka Navy, but to this beloved Sri Lanka, this country of ours. We value the initiative taken by Admiral Professor Jayanath Kolamage for dedicating this oration 
in memory of my father. I know as Admiral Kolombge has already explained, he has been an exemplary officer and a gentleman who has worked with my father very closely, admired by him, which we have known uh, from what he says at home about him. And I'm sure, like what he explained, the point that clicked would have obviously been their groundings at Dartmouth. Admiral Tisara Samarasinghe has done justice to the assigned topic. More than that, he has also explained his close connection with our family. He too being from Dartmouth, he is an officer of great repute and a gentleman. He was able to tell us through his lecture or the oration part of the vision that my father had for the Sri Lanka Navy and for this country. This event was supposed to be held last year, still with the pandemic, with a lot of restrictions and then finally it was decided that we will postpone it for better times. But when it was realized that this is the new normal, the numbers were scaled down from 500 to less than 150, and Admiral Kolombage has said we have to go ahead with this if my mother was willing to join us today. And after a long chat with her and the family, we gave our consent and we are here today. All this would not have happened if not for Rear Admiral Dimutuguno Andhra and his efficient staff of the Institute of National Secret Studies. I am aware the video that you saw at the beginning was done personally by Dimutu because last night he wanted me to have a quick look at it and I was in tears. When I complimented him, his words, it was a pleasure doing it for sir. So you can see the personal interest that most people who are involved in this event today have given. It's their 100%. We wish to also thank the commander of the Navy and past commanders, senior staff of the Ministry of Defense and State Ministry, members of the Diplomatic Corps, serving and retired military personnel for braving the present situation in attending this event this afternoon. Last but not least, I have to mention to you that we are very careful with my mother considering her age and her medical conditions. So unfortunately, she will not be joining for the fellowship after this event. You must excuse us for that, but I'm, ho I'm sure you will understand why we are doing it. So. Thank you very much, and thank you all for remembering my father, even after 28 years. And the family stands proud to know that people have not forgotten him.